no matter how much money you make you're 30 something years old you've got the rest of your life you've got to do something you're so young and it's like great experience and you've done all these things on the pitch and had these experiences going away and it gives you opportunities as well but you still have to live your life and do something with your life because as human beings we're creatures of habit we have to we can't kind of just sit around and in your head oh, i'm gonna go on holiday i can play golf i can do all you can only do that for a certain amount of time before you get the itch especially as a footballer because your life's so structured with the football you, you need to fill that void in this episode, we sit down with Jake Jervis, a footballer with over 300 professional games to his name, from his performances as both a striker and winger for various teams in the Football League, most notably Plymouth Argyle, to his international ventures in Turkey and Finland, Jake's journey is varied in experience. We delve into Jake's reflections on life after professional football, exploring his transition process and the factors that contribute to his contentment and presence in the moment. Discover why Jake finds fulfillment in pursuing further education through courses offered by the PFA and why he believes footballers are fully capable in achieving academic success after their footballing career. Jake also shares his perspective on the increasing value of player care roles within the football industry, highlighting why former players like himself are becoming indispensable for clubs aiming to prioritise player welfare. As well as this find out which book changed Jake's outlook as a footballer and significantly impacted his personal life. A big thanks to Jake for his openness in this episode. Check out the episode notes on where to find Jake online. What's your status right now? Obviously you played, I remember you as a, as a Pompey player, I'm a Portsmouth fan. Yeah, so what's your status now? I saw that you were abroad for a few years and you now seem to be back in the UK. So where are yeah. you now? Yeah, so um played various years abroad in different countries um but yeah now i'm kind of in that period of transitioning really so i've um playing part-time currently just near me oh. um do some coaching um i've got a few qualifications that i'm doing as well in counseling and different things around the uh, athlete's lifestyle and different player care roles so um yeah kept busy with all that at the minute so it's kind of at the minute i felt as if that transition just feels right and i'm kind of at peace with it at the minute yeah good i mean i mean that's something we want i want to go into is obviously um that transitioning stage but just going back to you as a footballer you had a few years abroad like what um was that a good experience for you was that something you would recommend to other footballers um timing wise timing wise it made sense yeah um around the covid time and the things that are going on and the the kind of deals players were getting offered and the deals i was getting offered it just didn't make sense for me not to go abroad really with the offer that i had and <clears throat> the opportunity um so when i was, I was young 21 right. years old i went to turkey um had a lot of problems not getting paid and different things it took years and ultimately led to me not being able to play for almost 10 11 months after that and not getting paid in that time as well for all that time so um yeah there was a lot of things around that that put me off initially but if that would have gone smooth sailing and i would have been paid i probably would have stayed abroad in those kind of countries and played there because i really enjoyed it the whole experience and the way the football's played um yeah there's just some you're playing with some players that there's a, there's a big stigma in england where are oh, all these countries outside of england they can't be as good as us and all this and that and but some of the football played just tactically it's um mm. a different level in terms of understanding how to play movements you make taking your time on the ball uh the way we build up play and stuff so um obviously england's very the tempo the uh, it's energetic all those different things which make it exciting makes it exciting obviously at all levels in england so i think um the difference there was for my game it suited me a lot in terms of Obviously, I've got pace and I can run in behind and all those kind of things. Would be able to get on the ball and show what I really can do. It was one of those really that helped me at the time. And um, fast forward into when I went out to Finland, it's probably up there one of the favourite places that I've played. To be honest, um, the place the place was just a lovely place to live uh, yeah. with your family and there's a bit of everything to do kind of thing so everyone's first thing everyone thinks are oh, Finland oh is it cold how cold is mm -hmm. it that's the first thing everyone asks and says about it but it's um it's a beautiful place in the summer you get great summer um just like here really when, when the summer but it's probably even longer um so it's beautiful lakes and stuff like that so that side of things was nice but I'll probably say that over my career in those two and a half years tactically and my understanding of the game went a lot higher and through the roof compared to previous years and when I played in England so um it's a positive for me really enjoyed the experience scored plenty of goals again um got to play in the Europa League Europa Conference League 
in qualifiers there. Um, so yeah, really enjoyed it. It was a good level of football mm. and um, good people as well, and good people as well. So for me, it was um, a good experience overall. And then um, yeah. went to the other end of things when I went to um, India for six months, which was a total other end of um, what I'd been used to the organisation and everything in Finland and the way everything had been to a bit unorganised if I put it in a polite chaos. way yeah chaos basically I saw just the way I can it, say it can't I yeah, you're not allowed to say it because you're the ex, <laughs> you're the ex footballer but I can say it's absolute chaotic yeah so it was very different different way of living compared to when I was in Finland and um, obviously the time difference and stuff like that made it very difficult for me away from my family so um yeah, that was the big difference with that. But um, again, it was an experience and I got to experience different cultures and again, around different people mm. and different things. So it's um, I'm very lucky to say that I've experienced these things in Turkey, Finland, um, India. So it's um, something that I'd we said about recommending. I'll, 100% I'd recommend it. So many, so many players in England that their playing style and the way they are in terms of everyone wants to be aggressive and height and this and that and all these different yeah. things but there's so there's there's so much more out there for him to experience not only on the pitch but off the pitch there's life experiences that you can take and you can really carve out a really good career for yourself even if i could recommend scandinavia for example you start in finland then you've got yeah places like sweden norway denmark which are you can look at like hoyland and all the players that are coming from there it's a high level of play so that could be your enrolled and then you could go out there and then even in asia there's um so many experiences that you can um, have in your life and on the pitch that the football might and not Australia be. Australia as well. You get this is the thing, yeah. Australia, there's so many places you can really go and have a great life and really build a good career for yourself as well. Is that something that you, I mean, because I look at the USA and I, I mean, I love the the US for me. They just, as people, they uh, want to be high achievers. They're not afraid of saying, I want to succeed at something. I think... British maybe a bit more reserved and yeah we might want to be successful but we want to keep it to ourselves in house like, is there I see the the college system as um a real big opportunity for lads and girls as well to go over there and, and get their education paid for they'll probably get as a scholarship if they if they're good standard the pro soccer league is a possibility do you think there's something there that if you maybe you would have done something differently when you were younger or that you would advise others to look at that um yeah i think it's all totally down to you as a person and where you are both as a footballer but off the pitch also cause academically like you say in america having that dual career where you're playing playing um in the mls that opportunity to go to the mls the draft and the college and get your um education paid for i think it's massive because now that i've come up um towards the end of my career in 28, 29, around that time when I went to Finland probably, that's when I started looking into the education more and really um, right. using that as, to my advantage with the PFA and the courses that are available and the funding. But mm -hmm. if you can get that from a young age, it, I feel like it takes away this pressure as well that footballers have of, I've got to be all in and everything's about my football and it kind of lets you relax a bit to know, okay, oh. Got to be in the first team at 18, 19. Exactly that, yeah. And at least you're not so focused, that focused in on the football side of things. And I've got to earn this money to do this for my family and do all that. You've got a uh, another option. I don't, I don't like to say a backup. Yeah, I don't like to say backup plan because, of course, football is your all in, but it's an option, isn't it? You've got another option there. Um, okay, I've got another career. That could be going on in the background as well, which could really help you when if football's not going right, okay, I can switch off, focus on that come back to our football and that could really help you to mentally switch off and give you that space that's needed for football because it is very intense yeah um i'll get into the counseling because i'm really interested in the counseling side and i could talk about that for a long time and i think there's big benefits that i'm not sure where you're looking to go down that path with counseling if it's within sport or outside of sport but i think there's a big uh need for it but we'll get into that just going back to turkey who like that how that I'm not going to go into the like the city side of you know goats being uh killed and all that stuff but you're young you're going over there and you're a young guy was there any kind of like due diligence of this is the club you're going to this is going with the contract like who has given you advice to um to make sure you're not going to be in this difficult situation because unfortunately that is a shit situation for you to be in to not play you're only 22 
if I'm right, say in 2022. Um, was there was there kind of research done about this? Um, not massively, no. It was kind of interesting. I was at Portsmouth at the time, so when um, things, I think, Are you it, that desperate to get away, pop no. <laughs> this is the thing. The, the thing was the first time around when I went to Portsmouth, I really enjoyed it and I started really well. I scored that goal in my first game off the bench when I was on loan. And then I got recalled. So otherwise I would have stayed and potentially even joined, joined oh, okay. at that point. So, Back to Birmingham. Yeah, so I got recalled at the time. But in the, I think it was a game against Preston at home. Um, the It was a, an agent that was working for the club in Turkey. Um, they came to watch uh, Eyes on McLeod that was playing at the time up top. And I was oh. obviously playing in the game. Um the game had happened. I played quite well in the game. This was the game just before I got called back. Um, and then they got in touch really about, oh, would you be interested? At the time, wasn't it on my radar at all? Didn't even think about it. Then got recalled. Things at Birmingham happened with a manager there, which had a conversation and whatever with that. That didn't really go very well. So then it was kind of like um, I was allowed to leave in the January. Um, had offers, but the problem was because of my age, they had to pay the compensation. They were the only team at the time that were ready to, okay, we'll pay the compensation, not a problem, we'll do this. And so they came in and I just got a call into the office and said, look, this team's put a bid in. I was like, who's this team? And they said, Elijah Spore. And I was like, who's this team? Without being disrespectful, I didn't know anything about the team. And they were like, yeah, it's a team in Turkey. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, spoke to him and I said Maiden was like look this is what it is and to be honest he said about it he said oh look this is the money and I was like wow it was it was it was a lot of money for someone at 21 years old to go and play in a, right. a top league Turkey like Galatasaray Fenerbahce so I'm thinking it's that or I think of a league two league one do I want to drop down to that that level just at that time because and I thought it was a it was a good opportunity to go and play in the top league so, Turkish league is one of the top leagues in, yeah. in Europe and I was thinking yeah, I'll go out there. Let me speak to him. Go and speak to him. So I went out there to meet them. At, um, it was like a training camp because they had the winter break. They were coming back. So it was in the January. I went to meet them at um, a training camp in Antalya, which Antalya is a holiday place, a lot nicer, hotel and all these different things. But I wasn't aware that that wasn't the same place mm. where I'd be. So it wasn't made clear to me that, yeah, yeah, they're like, oh, yeah, Lazig. I think they did it for a reason, me- meeting me there. So it would be kind of, yeah, this is what it's like and this and don't worry about when we go back there. Know what they're doing, yeah. Yeah, 100%. So, um, yeah, met at the hotel and then from then I didn't go back. So the deal, they even added a bit more money onto the deal and because I was all in an hour, I wasn't sure, I added a bit more money. I was like, okay. And it, it was hard to turn down. 21 years old, hard to turn down. Um, first game was going to be against Fenerbahce. Like, let's just do it. It was one of those things where I, I yeah, haven't shied away from it. Like, let's do it. Um, partner Big wasn't very happy about it. She had to bring all my suitcases. It was snowing in England. She had to <laughs> lug all my suitcases off for me because I couldn't come back. So um, she wasn't happy about that. But um, yeah, so my first game <laughs> um, was against Fenerbahce. I think it was three days later. Obviously, me not being too aware of Fenerbahce, what the club it was like, I didn't realise how big of a club it was. So um, I was, we've got our first game. Um, we're driving into the stadium and you kind of drive yeah. into the stadium and you go underneath the stadium as you come in. But as you come in all across the roads, there's like fans and stuff. And I thought, oh, are these our fans? Wasn't sure. And I knew it wasn't our fans because things just got start getting launched at the bus. <laughs> so um, I knew, okay, that's, that's intense. Okay, cool. Wow. Um, got into the stadium and then um, looked at the stairs like, well, nah, it's a bit different to that. So um, got into <laughs> the stadium, massive the stadium. Way. And then I got excited. That's that's what I live for, the big stadiums and stuff like that. So um, started the game. and then, But I didn't realize how many people would be there. So obviously I've come in. And then you come out for the warm up, and there's a few. But then once you actually come out and the noise you hear, I was like, "Wow, it's like forty thousand or something like that." And I was like, "Yeah, this is great. Played, started well, scored the opening goal, which um, is always if there's like a video clip where you see me us walk off and looking around because it's so quiet. We've got like a tiny section of fans up in, seems like they're up in the clouds, like a tiny section of fans which meant you couldn't even hear them because they were whistling. So I'm looking around thinking, was it offside and this and that? But it was a goal and. Yeah, so everything just happened really fast with that and then spiralled into all sorts of stuff going on on the pitch and being unorganised. And But um, the actual football play, the players, the, some of the players I played with, just their ability-wise was, was a joke. Just natural ability, to what they could do on the ball and how it was so like a lot slower. And then as soon as we got into the second half, it was move the ball sharp, people do bits on the ball, movement and 
yeah, that was it was something that I, I enjoyed. The football side of it, I enjoyed. I loved it. But then obviously there was a lot of factors around it with the money and having to ask for your money mm. and having getting it late and not getting paid. And so that side of it obviously outweighed the actual playing side of things. And how who do you go to? Like as a let's say there's someone listening to this who might be going into football and then not sure about kind of representation and like to, where to get advice. Like how do you deal with that as um to go right where do i go to get help for this like legally yeah well legally usually you've got obviously you've got your agent would be your first port of call to say look what can we do speak to your agent um which can sometimes it can help sometimes they can be uns- unsure about um the route to go which backfired on me in terms of my agent for when i cancel my contract um that's it i cancel because i've got a thing in my contract as long as i put the letter in cancel it i'm allowed to leave if i've been not been mm. paid for a certain amount of months but the okay. problem was this was just before the window in England. So I cancelled it before the window coming back to England in the summer, summer window. The club cancelled my registration after the window, which meant I couldn't play. And that's sub- what meant I came to Portsmouth after that. But that was seven months and I went all that time without paying, 10 months without pay. So obviously it's your agent can help, but also be detrimental as well because they might not be very clear on how it works and different things. So there's... um. PFA, there's people at the PFA. This is, eventually I went through spot someone at the PFA um who got in touch with because FIFA I've got the thing FIFA from a country, but FIFA can take years. I had two and a half years yeah. without hearing anything from FIFA. So I wow. got in touch with FIFA, didn't hear anything back. So um spoke to someone at the PFA who put me in touch with a um a lawyer who um he actually it kind of mine came about from when I came back from Turkey, a player went out there, a player called Luke Moore. He's played Aston oh, yeah. Villa and yeah. different clubs, Villa, yeah. but he wasn't pay- he wasn't paid a penny. So he was about to go through the same process of getting his money back. So this lawyer was like, okay, look, uh, we can do both of them together. Uh, this is what we'll do. We'll go down the route of putting san- trying to get sanctions against the club, which is very slow. And then they used um, CAS, uh, which is like the operation of sport. Yeah. So, which is a lot more an independent body so um mm. all the decisions are a lot more fairer as to say if i can pull it in like a way against fifa and different proper things mediation, so it's yeah. kind of yeah proper mediation and um things are done in the right way so they're the routes that you go if you are playing abroad that going through cast it's um a much smoother process and you're not waiting years on end to get things obviously the club that you're trying to get the money from and the wages you paid can obviously long out the process but the actual process speaking to cast that can work and but even then i got the settlement i was paid two months of the settlement it was supposed to be paid over a 12 month period i got the first two months and then they stopped paying again so um you just want to get it over with don't you i'm guessing you just want to get on with your life and just get this is the thing and bear bear in mind this is this is four years four years had passed when i got to this point what? so it's Seriously? four years later Jeez, um, you're out of football. You're so, out of football for however many months, but you still the whole process took years. Yeah, it took years. It was about five years until I actually got the settlement money. So I agreed on the settlement, which was less than because I signed wow. a three and a half year contract. So it was um, I had to settle for a certain amount of money because they were claiming if oh, I would give you all this money, the club would go bust, and this and if the club were got, were to go bust, <laughs> I wouldn't get any money anyway. So it was kind of like okay, listen. I'll I'll settle on I'll settle on what I'm going to settle on. So I got to that point, got paid the first two payments, and then um, uh, didn't hear anything. Everyone I couldn't get in touch with anyone. I was getting trying to email all the all the people I was talking to, and then it just went quiet. So in the end, I used the the lawyer that I used in England was like, look, I've got contacts in Turkey um, that can go through the Turkish courts, which i was i was very hesitant to do for the fact mm. of i could pay this guy money to go and do what he's got to do and then nothing could happen it could just be the same process i might not hear from him and different things so um went for that process and luckily enough straight away he managed to there was a new uh, actually my, <laughs> rewind a bit my partner found out that um the club had got a new owner through twitter i don't know how it just came up she looked at it did a bit of research so then um, that's when I said to the lawyer, look, you need to act on it. And he's like, yeah, we'll get it sorted. Spoke to the club, managed to freeze wow. the owner's assets through Turkish court. And then they couldn't um, pay for anything or function for his company until they paid off their debts to the players. So 
happens that was done and then within a week i got the whole payment so the whole payment was done all of it so it was all paid to me and then um finally it come to an end really so yeah it was a a long drawn out process it's unfortunate which... you hear that a lot about in turkey you hear i remember darius Fasel going out not getting yeah. paid uh obviously luke moore you mentioned there yourself it seems to happen a lot to when uh, british players go out and it's just kind of this obviously it's not just british players it might be players from europe as well but yeah it's unfortunate because there's some big teams there fenerbahce galatasaray some like historically big teams and it just seems to take that image a little bit of do you want players to go there or not or do you want them to kind of be wary of it yeah I think, I think that's the thing it's like because like you say the teams it's the atmospheres are crazy the stuff that goes on the way fans like one of the games um, chairs were getting chucked on the pitch all this because the decision didn't go against them and all it's, it sounds crazy but to be in that atmosphere it's like a an amazing like, you know like kind of wow this is all going on and you're playing in it and the whistling and the noise and the atmosphere to so play in those atmospheres is there's nothing like it so it's obviously a great experience for the player but like you say the other side of it back then i think it's better now there's a lot more cases now where you don't get that issue with the money but back then and you still get them but it was a lot more common back then where yeah. people weren't getting paid they had to leave and all these kind of things so yeah like you say it taints it a little bit because it is a great experience and you can have a great life out there yeah so then you get back to uk and it seems like at plymouth you really kind of found your your team you were like scoring goals there you were playing a lot yeah i think that was the the one team and manager um the manager just gave me that just go and play like the confidence of okay if i had a bad game I'd be in the next yeah. game and I think that helped me as a player really just knowing that I can stay in the team pre I think pre-season I scored 12 goals or something in the pre-season and then by October I was on 11 goals in my first season there so it was kind of started off flying and wow. that was from playing from a wide position as well as playing out on the right so um scored plenty of goals and had the Wembley promotions and it was uh Probably, probably the the what that's 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 yeah. got to be the one team for me in my whole career that, and I'm I, on my Instagram. Different people will see it. The the love that I have for that club and um, the fans and just the way the tight. Yeah. I think a lot of it's attached to my family being down there as well. well. My little girl, the memories that I've got with her living down there. It's um, very special place to me. Yeah. You talked about your daughter there. So I look on your Instagram and there's a lot of stuff about you being grateful. And I listened to um, uh, a podcast when you were at the Finnish football club. I'm not going to say the name. I can't really remember it anyway. But uh, how you, when your daughter was born, you seemed to um, kind of change perspective a little bit of your life and became more grateful because of your your child. I don't know if you've only got one child or, or more, but um, was that the time where you started to think, Oh, I've got. I'm not just a footballer now. I've got something else to kind of uh, live for, concentrate on. Yeah, I think um, up until that, I think I'd had um, a lot of low moves, which I'd score goals on pretty much all of my low moves. But there was reasons are for. Sometimes it was me wanting to move on, just not feeling settled. I had a lot of attention on me, so I'd go to another club and different things. But then, um, even with some managers not wanting me and different things, it was kind of like I felt I was focusing so much as a young player on okay, I've got all these targets, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, setting goals yeah. for the game, I've got to do this amount of plays and score this goal and do all these different things. It's a but lot of pressure. That just now, and that's the thing. A lot I'm putting a lot of pressure on myself. And yeah, this target setting, it just wasn't for me, target setting and all these different things. And there was kind of like a switch where, and it's when I was out the team at Ross County, when um, Derek Adams got sacked earlier on in the season and then another manager came in and I was out the team and it was kind of like, I was doing all my extra training and all these different things. But there was a book that was given to me. Everything seems to come back to Portsmouth. When I was at Portsmouth, by my landlord, he gave me a book, um, Chip Management, which... Um, Chip Management. Didn't touch chip management, it's called, yeah, by Dr. Steve Peters. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't touch the book. I, I wasn't a book reader. He gave it me, didn't think anything of it. And then I thought when I was um, in Scotland, I oh, let me read parts of this. And it just like a switch clicked. Like I had my little one um, around that time, which allowed me to switch off from football instead of coming back from games. That would be, all I'd be in my thoughts, thinking about, oh, what if this happened? I should have done this. And and all these thoughts whirling around in my head and they'll carry on for a few days and stuff. So then it was kind of like, as soon as I got home, I haven't got a choice. I've got to look after my little one. 
little one he saw in, that was my switch. I'd see her smiling and that was it. And the thoughts would just go away. So it allowed me just to really right. relax and engage with my little girl. And um, then the book was um, a big part of understanding these thoughts and how they're going through my mind. And the chimp likes to go haywire, uh, like worrying about this and texting you about this and that and all these different thoughts. So, um, yeah, the whole... Yeah. Process it's always on your shoulder, just, like just talking away. This is the thing: goes on your shoulders, talking away, and you've got you, you've got you who you are as the person where you want to go and do those things, but your chimp's going to be saying this and that and all these thoughts. But it's about managing your chimp and not fighting your chimp. So if you try and fight your chimp, your chimp's stronger. Your thoughts are going to win because you're going to get into a battle with your thoughts and different things. So it's about understanding your thoughts, recognizing they're there, but it is just that a thought that will pass and go by. Yeah, it kind of brought me to a place of just took the pressure away where. Normally, as a striker, I know you've got to score a certain amount of goals. Um, you've got to perform. You've got to do this. You know, you know, if you get double figures, you've had a good season. So, ultimately, by me setting a, get a goal at, um, at targets every game and doing all these things, it's irrelevant. I know if I've played well. The, you'll know from the fans. Yeah. You'll know from the manager. You know from this and that. And you look. So, I don't need to set these targets. I understand what I need to do. As long as I put my habits in place before the game and stick to those, it becomes natural. And then. I'm in game mode straight away kind of thing. So that kind of helped from when I was at Plymouth and being settled, that helped took me on. And then it's kind of been like throughout my career. And then even at Finland, it kind of took, took on another level where I was just able to be very present and grateful for my surroundings. And it might have helped being in Finland as well, the way it was in such a beautiful place, could go on walks and just really just be in the now and present in that moment. And that's where the being grateful and all those things just really took on another level and allowed me to know, like I mentioned about the habits, the daily habits just became, built that discipline. So even motivation is never, no one's ever motivated all, all the time. You'll have motivation for a certain amount of time. You'll watch something or something will happen. Yeah, I'm really motivated. Within a certain amount of time, that's gone. But if you've got your habits you do every day, you've got your habits before a game that you do, it would just be a switch. You're disciplined, you're in your motion. So even when you don't want to and you haven't got that feeling, You'll just go into that mold and go into the gym. If I'm doing it consistently and I do my habits, my prehab and all these things, it just comes natural. It's second nature to me and that gets you through it. So that's kind of what's got me to the point where I am in my headspace and where I have been over the last four or five years. Um, and really it's shown on, on the pitch and in my life as well. It's really helped me. So have you kind of adapt, kind of used mindfulness as well, kind of in your habits? Yeah, definitely. It's the, for me, the being present in the moment, really being present and we can, we can live in a, we can think about the past all the time, the future, but really being in that moment and enjoying that moment, even if things are going against, against you, just looking around and like, I do it before a game and I'll come out, I'll do my little habits. I've got two little hops that I do when I come on the pitch, different things when I walk out, um, just before the game and I'll kind of look around and that's my acknowledgement of like, yeah, I'm playing football. I get to play football as a job. And it's yeah. kind of just a thing where you look around, you're like, oh, okay, you get excited from the fans, you see this and it's like this goal time now and it gets me excited. Regardless of where I'm playing, um, I had a game last night, I was playing, uh, played against a team called Tividale. Um, there was no disrespect to them. It's like, I didn't, it's not been on my radar because I played at a certain level because I'm playing part-time. I came out, there's a certain amount of fans that I was like, and I could hear boys say, oh, if this game was off, wish this was off the rain, the weather. And I was just like, you get to play football. Like, you're getting paid to play football, whatever yeah. level, you get to pay to play football. Like, just yeah. enjoy the One moment. Day you won't be. And that's the thing. That's the thing. Just being grateful that you get to play football and even taking it back a step from that. I'm grateful I get to get out of bed. That's one for me. I'm grateful I get to. So the word I get to, instead of saying I've got to, I get to. So it's like, I get to, mm. I get to get out of bed. I get to have a dream. I get to walk here i get to do i'm able to do it you know what i mean because there's a lot of people that aren't able to do it and being grateful for the small things really makes a big difference where have where has this come from i know you mentioned the book is there kind of like have you have you tried to talk to any teammates in the past few years about this or you kept it to yourself because i feel with football yeah you know, i heard in the podcast you say the one in finland how you said banter in in the uk it can be quite brutal you know and I could imagine, would you keep these kind of thoughts to yourself in that kind of area? Do you know what I mean? Because I want, I think it's a complete positive thing. And I want, you know, I think it can help footballers. But at the same time, there'll be some guys who just would be kind of like, what, Jake, what are you on about? Oh, 100%. That's some, um, 100%. I think that's as I've got older as well. I just, 
you, you don't you don't care well you shouldn't care as much that's the thing you tend to think i don't really care as much but um yeah it's kind of when i say the the banter is brutal little it's a lot of things in comments everywhere like people that have banter about oh like oh look at his baggy touch his bad touch and all these different things and all it's just banter but ultimately yeah. i know a lot of players that you're saying it to they're going to take that on it's going to be like oh, they're going to take on about the touch then they're going to take of this and it can happen to a lot of people you see in training and different things like people getting onto people and there's banter about off the field stuff which i think is great because it it builds the rapport and you know what i mean which is banter between friends and everything that, that's needed because it builds the rapport but then there's obviously other comments that aren't really needed and people making a comment about a player and what they're doing and saying it around them to the face it, it's got to leave a lasting mark whether that's subconsciously or they're very aware of it kind of thing so um for me that was in Finland because British change room is very loud rowdy there's banter there's people the way they are which is great for certain amounts of things and people getting people going and all that kind of stuff but in Finland it's very people are very reserved reserved in that respect so it's kind of before the game it can be quiet if there's no music on you turn the music off you won't really hear people talking and it's very quiet to get people going and that was where I think I came to the forefront and um, developed as a person because I was able to really okay uh -huh. someone's got to get people going here I think that's the bit that's missing here someone needs to get people more going more of a leadership quality yeah, yeah leadership quality I ha I've had it from Plymouth Plymouth it was put onto me an onus on me to do it more and it kind of went from there and then there was more and it developed but in Finland is really where I would do the talks before the game we're getting a huddle the manager would say look I want you to do a talk today I did it a few times and it just naturally came to me. I, I felt comfortable doing it. And instead of doing that, oh, yeah, boys, we've got to fight. We've got to do all this. And uh, that talk, I was generally like, look, go out there, enjoy yourself. Everyone knows what the, what the job is. We are good. We, all of us are good players. Otherwise, we won't be here. Concentrate on that. Focus on the positives. Do what you've got to do. And we'll come together. And everything will be all like that kind of, instead of just putting the pressure on people, it just allowed them to really settle down and, but at the same time, it got people going. I'll do it in a way where it get people going and I'll say to you, you've got to do this, you've got to do and really help people. It's kind of like a, that was needed in that environment. So I think it's understanding what environment you're in. Like you say, me saying about this being present to people and all this, it's about recognising which people really right place, would yeah. take it on. Yeah, right place. Who's going to take it on? And within every change room, there's a player that you'll say something to um, and it'll go out one ear. One take no notice of it, whatever. And then there were the other players that were really needed. And it was just like, oh, look, you, you can just go on a small thing. Like last night it happened in the game. A player, good player, turning on the ball, lost the ball, turning on the ball, lost the ball. But he's trying things. He's trying to get on the ball and stuff. And number 10, I was like, look, trust yourself. You're a good player. Don't worry about it. Next ball. And you could see it kind of give him a little lift. And you say it, just little little comments allow people to really build that confidence and onto the next one. Because that's what I struggled some with other, when I was Some other players might dig him out and... This is the thing. So, I'll oh, keep the ball in, you know what I mean? And it, the standards and stuff and its expectations because it's an industry where people are getting paid a lot of money. You've got a livelihood to think about managers and all that stuff. So, people are going to yeah. be on you. So, there's an expectation you have to you have to live up to. But there's ways of doing it. And, and me, as a player and having the skills that I've got over with the counselling, the understanding of um, the self-awareness and all those things, I feel that's for now and like it has been for years now to have a real onus to help people it's it just makes sense really to me to try and build someone up but at the same time if someone needs telling then you can, you can let them know you know what i mean there's a balance to it there's a balance to it and there's a way of doing it for me so let's talk about the counseling so what why did you get into that area what interested you was it um just carrying on from the was there something about the kind of passing on information or kind of helping someone or was that what interested you about the counseling side or maybe just listening yeah then this is the thing initially it was uh, i'm not sure i'm coming towards well i was 29 i was thinking what do i want to do after and i was talking with my partner about the questions and my paths and stuff and a few people had mentioned to me about oh the mentor thing and that that route and then um i was speaking to a guy at the psa that um and the education department and he mentioned about that um there's a court, there's a fully funded course at the minute of level two counselling, um, counselling skills. So I was kind of like, I, to be honest, I had doubts because it was an academic, academically you had to do some kind of essays, assignments, and 
it's not me. It was coming out of my comfort zone. I've not really done that since I was a kid or anything like that. And I've had different investments and stuff away from the field, but that's a different kind of thing where you're not really, okay, I've got to do this work. Yeah. I've got to talk to people on Zoom. Am I going to be able to do this? Am I going to be confident enough to do that? Because it's a different kind of field to what you're used to. You know what I mean? Coming out of your comfort zone, doing it. And when I first started it, the thing I wrote on my front of my book was coming out of my comfort zone. So that was the, the main title on the front yeah. of my book. And then the next course at my level three is in my comfort zone. So it's kind of, I've come to that point where I've developed and I've really um, come to a point to be at ease with it. So it's um, it a whim, off a whim really. Let me try it, see how it was. And I loved it. So um, the whole dynamics of it and the understanding of silence and how you work with silence and open questions, the way um, things are received and hearing things. And like say the listening part, it was... Um, I found myself without subconscious, without without knowing, I was kind of before people would be talking, and I'm already thinking of sort of like a response in my head. So like, oh yeah, they're talking, and in your half, not are you really listening? That's something I've learned where mm. you sit there taking what someone's saying, really take it on, acknowledge it, and then it gives you that time to like formulate a real response kind of thing instead of just going off something because you can jump in and they they're like, ah, oh, well I'm I was about yeah that's what I was about to say kind of thing. So. Yeah, there's a lot of things in, um, around it with the skills and the understanding of your self-awareness, which um, have really stuck with me and then kind of brought me to a point now where I've got a route and a path that I potentially want to go down. What, what's your goal with that? Would you like to be stay within football or sport with, within count, you know, for counselling or is it something different? Uh, I think initially, like say, it was, I was doing the counselling and as I went through the course, I realised that actual counseling itself wasn't really something that I really wanted to push down but the counseling skills and the understanding around it and understanding different things with CBT and psychodynamics which you're doing on the course now really getting a good awareness to it pushed me towards okay um doing my culture now which I really get a great satisfaction from helping and giving uh, football coaching yeah sorry um real satisfaction from helping in one-to-one sessions in group sessions um for me, I didn't have that player care side of things when I was a player of just everyone can say, oh, sports psychologist. And then this isn't a knock against sports psychologists at all. This, for some people, it works great. That is their kind of thing. They need it to kick them on and that little mm-hmm. 1% and all that kind of stuff. But it's very, oh, what is your, for me, when I was younger, it's very, oh, what are your aspirations? What's this? What's your I, perfect goal and all this? We can work towards this. You're going to be the best this. Why yeah. can't you be this? You can do all this where all it takes sometimes is oh should we go for a coffee have a little tour what's on your mind what's going on in in, in your life like because for me if you're personally in a great space it gives you the best chance professionally to flourish and show what you're about on the pitch so those things where there might be something going on in someone's life and this is the yeah. thing for like fans and different cultures and all that kind of stuff they're in an industry where it's performance based and all that kind of thing so you have to perform but ultimately people with human beings footballers are human beings first and that's that's the big thing that's missed and i think that's missed by the footballer themselves as well they they hold on an identity and an attachment to i'm a footballer because the first thing you're asked wherever you go is oh, how's football how's this what and do you do? it'll be the first yeah. question and what do you, you know what i mean it's kind of like it's a it's a big topic because it's every boy's dream to be a footballer as such so it's um it's uh it's difficult it's difficult on a human being level on a humanistic level to be extremely com- confident in you as a human being because of all these different factors from football where your self-esteem will get knocked you're getting told every day you're not good enough or you're not playing in this and all these factors come together to yeah. obviously make it especially difficult especially in this so, data-driven um, world of football where there's kind of like you oh, know, you're being tagged 100%. and you're being, you're being tracked on how much you're running and stuff and it must be difficult just to have this you want someone maybe just to come and say, you know, is everything okay? Or how, how are you actually getting on? Are you comfortable at home? That kind of thing. That's the thing. And I think that's the the part where <clears throat> there's not much, like I say, that I haven't experienced with football. They haven't been in all these different countries, having these setbacks, being on so many loans and different cultures and managers. And there's not much I've not... Away from home. ...experienced within football, away from home, the isolation, all those things. And that's where I think I can really help players 
um, at all stages of the career because football is about transitions, no matter athletes in general. And this is what I'm learning, speaking to different people and networking with people in different sports as well. Transitions happen in all all stages of your career, in football, in life, and at the end, at the start, throughout. It's always a transition, so in whatever form that comes in, and it's um, who's really helping you for all these for all these. And instead of being reactive, why can't we be proactive and say, okay, exactly, this yeah. is what you're going to experience. These are the feelings you're going to have a lot of feelings, and whether it goes good, bad, you're prepared because you know this is what will happen. So if we're proactive, I think there's going to be a lot more. Uh, players, kids, adults, whatever level you're at, that will be a lot more successful or just prepared um, on the human side of things. That, And that's the part for me that at least, even on the football pitch, there's a lot of things out of your hand that you can't control. So even if it doesn't go the way you want it to go, you're still, as a human being, you're still understanding of your thoughts and feelings and why you're feeling that way and aware of it all. And you know it's coming or this, you know what I mean? So it allows you to be in a space where hopefully you don't go to that point of too far, you know what I mean? Mm. And things that have happened around friends in my life and family members in my life, that it doesn't go to that point where that's your only option out. So yeah, it's um, an important part for me. It's that kind of that player care side of things and the coaching as well. So bringing that together, a bit of the coaching and the player care and I feel it's needed. And I think that's in football now you can see this player player care roles and different things but I feel of course you need the logistics side of things but you do need people that have been in football and experienced it to be able to to let the players know because of course exactly that and I think the combination of having um, the two people the theory side of things and the practical side of things um, can really be useful for players of all ages. I think that's interesting what you said about how you took some skills from the counseling and you've been able to kind of use that. Um, you know, you've tried something, maybe that isn't exactly what you want to do for the future is to be a counselor, but you've taken some skills and have adapted that to maybe coaching or adapted that to just this player care role. That sounds like for me, that sounds like a teacher. So what's the next stage for you regarding that? Cause that sounds really interesting about the player care. Is, is, is this something that is needed in football more? Yeah, hundred percent. I think there's there's player care roles now and services within teams and the way things are being done. But I can definitely see after speaking with people and within clubs and different things as well <clears throat> that is going down that route of yeah, we need more players that have had the lived experiences and the things to really connect with the young players. For example, they've got it's hard because even as a teenager, you're at a point where. You, people tell you something you don't really take it on and different things and you f- you feel you feel you know best and all these kind of things and coming from someone that's really done what and being at where you want to be makes a difference to when you're younger you know what I mean you'll look up to someone mm. or you'll see it in a different light so I feel it's definitely needed where just someone real you know what I mean someone's real with you and like I said about the sports psychologist side for me this is just my experience that I've had in with psychologists when I was younger yeah. it just it wasn't real it was kind of like a oh, let's live in this kind of, this dream world of everything can be amazing. And I can, it makes me laugh. I think about it. It was kind of like, I was asked, oh, where, where can you see yourself? Is, what's your dream club? And w- what club could you really get to? If you really worked hard at this and that, and I was like, oh yeah, I can play for Real Madrid. I can do all of this. I can do all of that. Which, yes, you've got a dream, but there's kind of a realisation of things and a kind of being real about things and understanding where you're at and what you need to do to get to where you need to get to and that's kind of that worked better for me the what will be kind of what will be will be and um I was going to say accepting it's kind of as I've got older now towards this part of my career the word accepting it's kind of became a bit more it's had a bit more of a negative stance for it for me just because in mine it's kind of oh I've come to the end now do want to play full-time do want to stay part-time and then people have said, yeah. oh, yeah, well, you've just got to accept where you're at and accepting of it. And it was kind of like, well, that's a bit blunt for me. It's kind of like, okay, I'm at peace yeah, yeah. in knowing that I'm going to have days where I'm thinking, yeah, I really want to be in that environment and why can't I do this? And I'm going to be down and go with my thoughts. But I'm at peace with, I understand that. There's got to be days. There's got to be days where I'm great and all this stuff. But if I'm at peace with things, that's where I can move forward and I can look at my different things and, that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm really at peace with, I've got my processes in place. I know the path that I want to go down. 
And no matter what level I'm playing football, I'm getting my football fixed. I'm in an environment yeah, where I can have a bit of yeah. banter with boys and get all that kind of thing. But I'm still yeah. now moving forward with my life instead of waiting until I'm 36. And this is just me. Obviously, a lot of players want to play for as long as they can, as high as they can and all. But for me, it's kind of like, do I wait until I'm 36? Then by the time I'm 40, I'm at a place where I want to be. Or now I'm 32, coming up 33. Do I really push forward now because I've got the opportunities and I'm networking and there's a lot of things that are in place now that could really kickstart my second career as such. This why not yeah. roll with it now and really push forward with it and by the time I'm 35, it's a lot different, you know what I mean? And then I can kick on and sure, yeah. I've, I've gone through that kind of transitional period which no matter who you are and what player you are, what level, level, how much money you've made or not made, it's not easy transitioning and... Yeah, it's, it you gotta go through your battles, your days where you're down and you feel a certain way, and it's unjust as well. There can be unjust as, as to why. Hold on a minute, I'm still the same player. It's not the better player. Why isn't this happening? And, mm-hmm. and it's just natural. That's just the way football works. So it's being at peace with that and moving forward and understanding. And, and that could be the same for outside of football as well. If you're getting a job, a career, a business, you might be thinking, well, I'm better than that person why am I not getting that role it's good if you learn that rejection is just part of uh um going through life in any career whether it's sport or business definitely yeah life is not fair that's one of my high stones of life like through the chip management life is not fair it's you, you've got to be at peace with that because otherwise you're going to find yourself in a battle thinking oh hold on a minute this and that and you're fighting all these things and you, you don't concentrate on yourself you don't con- you don't control the controllables and you're too busy looking at everyone else instead of saying okay this is what i'm doing this is my path and this is what how we're going to go with things has there any has there been any um kind of former teammates that that you saw obviously you don't have to name name them but where you where you saw teammates kind of struggling with that transition and you kind of thought Oh, I need to also take that into consideration that that's going to happen for me. Or were you maybe just too young to be going? Oh, are you just concentrating on your football at that time? Um, I'd probably say I've I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen players that come. The part that I've seen is players that have come to say thirty-two, maybe in different physical condition to me, and different things, and they've kind of forced going here and moving the family and doing that side of things, and really gone to places where they didn't need to go in full-time football and injuries and all that kind of stuff so I saw that side mm. of it and thought yeah that's that I can see mentally how that can be a big struggle for people and with football it's you can have a year-to-year contract two years one year but it's it, it's out of your hands of course you yeah. can play football and you can get offered your contracts but ultimately your next contract is whether x club wants to take you or this one it's out of your hands so for me taking like that own ownership back and having that in your hands really was something that I had a lot of thought about with seeing players getting to the end of the career and a lot of players not preparing before the end of the career. Like they'll get to the end and they're like, okay, now what should I do? Now mm-hmm. I'll start doing things. So I thought 28, 29, let's really focus on that now and have that in my head. And it helped me. It helped me to, again, it switched on even more for football. I was very good at that from Plymouth days and being on the pitch, I'd come off, enjoy it. And that'll be me. Like I, I understand good, bad, indifferent. I'm not going to go home and be in a mood around my partner because it's not very nice for her. And I'm not going to be in a mood around the kids because I want to be present. I want to be there with my kids instead of on my phone or in my thoughts or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, that kind of was a big thinking point for me coming towards this stage of my career into my thirties and stuff. So yeah, I wanted to really have something in place that allowed me to push on and it's kind of naturally become a thing because I've been proactive I think that's the biggest thing for everyone coming towards even before yeah. the end of your career the proactiveness in life in whatever you do you need to be proactive work life your family if you're proactive then thing, things will fall into place for you I'm, I'm a firm believer of taking action taking yeah. action if you're proactive with things things will happen it's it's a matter of time just going back to the education side, you know, you said about you you were kind of worried of going back into education and studying and stuff like that. So I think that's kind of a general theme with other lads. Um, I'll say I'll say just guys because you know you've just played in the you obviously just played in the male male uh, industry. So I think that kind of fear of educating, uh, going back into education, you've left school years ago. Do you think that kind of holds some people back? It kind of there is this opportunity there, especially with the PFA to 
really find something you're interested in. And if it does, and like you say, if it doesn't necessarily mean you stay within that industry, you will have learned how to learn again in a way. 100%. And I can say, yeah, 100%. Yes, it is because everyone that I speak to that has done the education side of things, they say the same thing as me. They're like, yeah, I was worried at the start about how much work I'd have to do and all these things. And even last night, I was talking to a player that I played with when I was really young when my first long move. He was like, yeah, same thing. Like, I was worried I've got these essays and I've got these 10 page essays and all these things to do. And he was just like, oh, but as soon as you start, you're all right. You get into it, you get into the flow of things. It's the fear, the fear and the thought is bigger than the actual real realization of what you've got to do. So I think once you get past that barrier and you take that leap of faith, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's there to really kick forward. And there's so much for players that can be achieved away from the field. And it's just about stepping out of your comfort zone. And like everything in life, if you step out of your comfort zone, you realize, oh, okay, that wasn't so bad. Then you go again and you become comfortable in the um, uncomfortable situation. You meant to say, you mentioned about the education thing and people just stepping out of the comfort zone, not being afraid to do that because that's really is a big part of it. The fear. I think fear is the biggest thing within football. And I think football is go off fear, good, bad, and different. They use it to harness it to play, but yeah, play to a certain standard. Stress. They need the stress, don't they? They need the stress because you need a little bit of it. But then obviously, there's that little bit of it, and there's that too much of where it crumbles you and cripples you in your performance and stuff. So it's the same with that um, the education. I think the PFA now have switched to. Um, away from uh, the education department to personal development department. So even in that wording, the word in there really helps a player to think, oh, okay, it's personal development. I'm developing as a person. And that's what you do as a football like you development and all that kind of thing. It's a, oh, let me improve my personal development. I think even that helps players to, and I feel like there's more players now coming around to the idea of, oh, I'm going to do a qualification and do this and that because even just the word is a, is that, that word, like you say, education, I'm going to go educate myself. It's like, First thing that comes into my head is is books, is computers and all the business school, the PFA have started, I think is good because you see, oh, there's like more players and high profile players doing it. And it's things within sport as well. It's like director of football. And I think those things are a lot easier for a player to say, okay, I can go into that industry because it's football. But then there is so many other things that you can do and explore as a person and in life that might be an interest to you but you just need that education well even not need that education because you might have got your own education but ticking that box to say okay i've, I've done yeah. that qualification i've done this and that it's there for you it's available to go and do it so people really need to take advantage of that and um set themselves up for a future career because again no matter how much money you make you're 30 something years old you've got the rest of your life you've got to do something so um yeah still so young Exactly, so young, and it's like it's a it's a part of your life. It's great experience, and you've done all these things on the pitch and had these experiences going away, and it gives you opportunities as well. But you still have to live your life and do something with your life because as human beings, we're creatures of habit. We have to we, we can't just sit around as once you think you in your head, oh, I'm going to go on holiday, I can play golf, I can do all. You can only do that for a certain amount of time before you get the itch, don't you? So you'll get that itch to want to do something in some structure in your life. So especially as a footballer because your life's so structured with the football you're going to have that you need to fill that void